Welcome to uh, the Kubernetes in production from the ground up talk. Can everyone hear me? I just hear like a nice big echo. So, all right, cool. Um, so I apologize if anyone has seen some of my slides here before. I'm reusing a few things uh, from the Kubernetes meetup here in Boston. Uh, but we're going to, I'm going to go real quick. I'm going to show you a lot of cool stuff of how we really dove in and built Kubernetes um, on our production systems. Um, so first, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the lead DevOps engineer at Barclay. Uh, we are doing really cool stuff with kernel drivers and hypervisors uh, for endpoint protection uh, that really reports back to a SaaS portal uh, so that small to medium-sized businesses don't have to manage security uh, on the, you know, kind of the, the management side of it. Um, so the Kubernetes portal that we build uh, that we deploy is is managing our SaaS components, um, really, so that we don't have to worry about it. Our money maker is what we install on the, the machines that protect people, so we don't really want to have to spend a lot of time or energy on our, our SaaS components, right? Um, I used to work at PayPal and eBay. Uh, I did a lot of uh, Kubernetes and uh, uh, Mesos research while I was there, uh, and did a lot of things kind of an older way, a, a, a more, uh, you know, we, we use a lot of Chef, we use a lot of Test Kitchen. Um, I've done talks on both as well. Um, current technologies that I'm really into, obviously Kubernetes. If you were around yesterday in a couple of the rooms, I kept bringing up the word, oh, well, Kubernetes solves that. Um, so, so I've been into that, Docker, Terraform, Ansible. Um, that's pretty much it for the most part. All right, now I know that everyone at a conference, you always take photos of everything that happens while you're you know, on the screen and everything. This is the one you want to take photos of. I already uploaded my slides here, my demos there. Everything else that's small print uh, will be on that slide share page, so just, you know, you can grab it there. I wouldn't worry about it that way. All right, this is cool. Now everyone's taking a picture. Um, so yeah, I'll go real quick. Uh, if you're just starting out in Kubernetes, the best place to start is really the docs page up at the top there. Uh, they recently redid it uh, on the Kubernetes repo. It's, it's really awesome. Um, there's just a, a ton of information there. Don't get overwhelmed. Dive into the getting started guides if, if you're not. Um, and I guess real quick, it'd be helpful to know who here w would say, uh, we did it yesterday in the first talk as well, but a, a beginner, medium, or expert user. So beginner, I barely looked at it. Okay. Medium, I've played with it, but probably not in prod or anything. Okay. Is there anyone else here running it in prod or using it? Okay. Cool. Using it heavily. All right. Cool. Um, so then uh, we chose to use CoreOS. So I also put the CoreOS docs up there. Uh, they're pretty good on at least how you get, get started. Um, Boston Kubernetes, we have a Kubernetes meetup here. I'm one of the organizers. Uh, so if you're interested, check that out. Um, the, one of the best places to get help on Kubernetes is Slack. Uh, they have a Slack channel, so just join it. Uh, there's you know, different groups you can join. It's all virtual, uh, so it's all online. So, All right, so let's get into this. So the problem statement that I've had is I've worked at a lot of companies, a bunch of companies, and my colleagues and I commonly found that as an ops person, I was always fixing things, right? I was, the, things were broken. They're never just, they never work. Uh, and we never had time to innovate. Like, there's all this cool stuff out there. Like, you know, like we, Docker was coming around, and, and everyone said, like, continuous integration. We were like, we have it, but we have to push one button. You know, we never really got there. So I really was trying to constantly think, if I had the chance to start over, what would I do? Um, and luckily, I got that. Uh, I went to a startup. I had given them advice beforehand of what technologies to use. And luckily, they picked uh, Docker and Kubernetes um, pretty heavily. Um, so our requirements uh, when we started using Kubernetes was really fast recovery without any human intervention. I hate being woken up in the middle of the night, and my girlfriend hates it even more. So uh, my goal is really like, you know what, if it's not catastrophic, if, if it means that there's a tiny bit of downtime and it recovers itself and it, you know, we're good for the rest of the night, I'm cool with that. My business does not require an SLA that is that high um, compared to my old business at PayPal. Um, but, uh, you know, we can solve most of those problems the next day, um, assuming our, our systems are, are, are kept up enough. Um, nodes are ephemeral. Who cares? Like, you know, if there's a problem with a node, let's just delete it. Like, I don't want to have to manage a specific node. I don't want to have to ever have to say again, oh, man, that, that server's a piece of crap. I hate going over to it. It always does this. 
You know, I just want to delete it if it's a problem child. Um, I wanted to use auto scaling. A lot of what we had done uh, at a few of my other companies was um, was um, just single node rollout. We would build our infrastructure with you know in the cloud, but it was it was not dynamic. It was not we couldn't just scale up or down. Every node was independent. So we really wanted to use auto scaling, which meant nodes were all very very similar. Uh, we wanted everything with Kubernetes to be testable on developer machines, so that you know it wasn't just oh, you hit this button and away it goes into Amazon or Google. Uh, we want to be able to test it locally, try things out, play around, you know, but make it similar to the cloud. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen when you have multiple VMs running different parts of, of Kubernetes. So we, we separated them out into a local VM infrastructure as well. Um, and then the last is infrastructure as an artifact. Um, it's it's not talked about a whole lot, but really your infrastructure is very much similar to the applications that um, that you're deploying. That you know, there's always artifact management. Um, you should be doing the same thing for your infrastructure uh, because you want to know what the last version was. Maybe the new version has a problem, so you want to be able to roll back. You want to be able to know what things are changing, and you want to be able to you know modify it as you go. All right, so here are a few of the uh, technologies. Uh, that we chose. Uh, now again, like I said, this is kind of what my company chose, what, what my team chose. Um, it's not for everyone. Uh, a lot of these can be mixed and matched as well. Uh, so we chose CoreOS because it removes the management layer that you really have to deal with with a lot of the uh, OSs. I'm a big Ubuntu Debian fan, but CoreOS just kind of worked, except for when you want to actually do anything that's not in a container. That kind of sucks. But whatever, just spin up a container. Um, uh, AWS, because we were already, our, the team once I joined was already on it, uh, but you could substitute Google Cloud there as well. They do a lot of great stuff over there, and Azure's doing some great stuff as well. Um, I, like I said earlier, I was a big chef guy, uh, but I wanted to try Cloud in it this time, which is like scary and like dumb in some ways, but it just meant everything was static. It just worked. Like I said earlier, it was, the, we have a versioned artifact of our infrastructure that always I can always look and see what we're spinning up and spin up the exact same thing locally because cloud in it was, was essentially the same thing in the cloud and on a VM locally. We use Docker, obviously. Uh, obviously, we're interested in Rocket and, and some of the other things that are coming up. I think yesterday Kubernetes announced uh, hyper containers, um, which is pretty exciting. So if you haven't read about that, take a look. It's on their blog. We use Terraform. Now, originally, we started with Ansible. Um, Ansible is cool. Ansible is really good at getting stuff to a server and configuring that server. But what we had a problem with when we were using the first version of Ansible 1.9, um, it was we had a lot of problems with Amazon. We just wanted to spin up, you know, uh, you know, different different components in Amazon. Basically, leverage the Amazon APIs and everything. And it just it wasn't meeting that. It, we had to do too much work. So I tried Terraform and I rebuilt everything I did in, in Ansible in about an hour. Uh, in Terraform because it just it manages what order things have to be built in, ripped down. Uh, it's it worked great for us. So um, yeah, and obviously Vagrant so that you could play with some of these VMs locally. All right, so that begs the question: Well, hasn't someone else built this? Well, this is March 2015, uh, back back when I was asking myself this question. So uh, let's quickly look at, at at the status of things back then. Um, the Kubernetes official scripts. Uh, they had simple bash scripts that would uh, spin up everything. It just worked. It kind of, it just came up and, and you had a cloud you could work with. Um, it set up an auto scaling group for minions. So that was kind of cool. That's kind of what I wanted. Um, and it used salt. So it, it had a config management uh, and it stored those assets up in S3. But the problems at the time, uh, there was no high availability of etcd without a lot of, you know, diving into how they made this thing work. Uh, there was no master high availability as well at the time. And the salt master was coupled with the master of Kubernetes, which I really didn't like that overhead. I really didn't want a management overhead for a lot of this. I already have Amazon managing a lot of stuff. I already have you know, a couple different layers here. I think I could do without the salt master in that way. That, but that was just my opinion at the time. And at the time, they also had Ubuntu and Fedora were the main components. You could do CoreOS, but it wasn't as documented. So I went over to CoreOS's official scripts. Um, they have a cool Go app to start it. All right. 
love it when I find like a cool little Go app that just does some magic, you know? Um, or they had cloud formation, which is fun, right? Um, but then what? Like once it comes up, there's no like, there's no way of tweaking the scripts. There was no easy way from, that I could see to just go to town and, and build this into a, something that could really scale at production scale. So there was no etcd high availability, no master high availability, and as I could see, lots and lots of magic. But again, these were just my observations at the time. So I said, well, it can't be that hard to build it myself, right? Um, I'm here to tell you a year later, it's possible. Uh, I did it. Um, and uh, so we're going to discuss that a little bit right now. Um, Kubernetes, if you're not familiar, let's dive in real quick to the components. There's three main components. etcd, which is your key value store, uh, the masters, and the minions. The minions run all of your actual pods and containers. The masters make all the decisions, and etcd stores all the stuff. That's it. It's, it's pretty straightforward. So let's look at etcd. I knew that if I wanted to build something myself that could scale to the way that the system that I worked on before at companies like PayPal scaled, y you need a good store. Yeah, that's, that's everything right there. So put a lot of time into that. So that's what I built first was a pretty good etcd. Um, and now this is my note to myself that I need to speed this up so that we can get to some cool demos, right? All right. <laughs> so etcd. Um, it's easy. It just works. If, has anyone here ever set up an etcd cluster? All right. Which is fun, right? Until then it fails over and that's problems. And then you have to deal with, you know, uh, how many you run, five, to, so you can fail over two nodes, all that jazz, right? Uh, so I really wanted to make it dead simple for this thing to come up and to run. Um, so on the right over here, I have the cloud uh, init files for, uh, for etcd. It's pretty straightforward. It's documented on CoreOS. Um, uh, we use cluster discovery. You could use discovery service, which like, yeah, that's great for etcd, but you don't really want to use that in production. Um, DNS, it works most of the time, but then you rely on DNS, and I don't know, I had mixed, uh, mixed problems with that in the past with the previous version of etcd. So what then? Well, um, I found a really cool project online by the guys at Monsanto. Um, I know. Um, uh, etcd AWS cluster. Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but what it does is it references uh, the AWS um, uh, auto scaling group that the etcd nodes are in, and it queries them back, and there you go, then you have an etcd uh, cluster. So when, when a node goes down, uh, a new node will query uh, AWS uh, for the other nodes in that group, and it'll remove any nodes that don't exist anymore and add itself back. Um, and there I had a auto-scaling etcd cluster that would fail over perfectly almost every single time. Um, so again, I know that this is a bit small. Uh, for those of you that came in late, I'll, I'll, give, I'll put out the links again, but it's all on there if you guys want the source. Um, but it just kind of worked. You put this in the header of the, the cloud init file, and your etcd cluster comes up. Then we use Terraform to launch etcd. This is it. That's all you got to do. Um, now, I have templated out with variables here, but all you have to do is these two things to have an auto-scaling group in Terraform for etcd. Um, you know, we, we set three in uh, etcd nodes in this cluster, but uh, in, in some of our production clusters, we do five or more. So that's, that's the easy part of the etcd cluster. Okay, so now the master nodes. So this is the real bread and butter of Kubernetes, is getting these master nodes to work. Uh, you've got your kubelet service, and the kubelet service starts up all the rest of your services. So you have the API server, controller manager, scheduler, and proxy. Those are the main components right now. Uh, they're constantly adding and changing, so every version kind of keep an eye out, but they, they, they add a lot of different components in. And then um, anyone here who was here yesterday for the, uh, the virtual networking uh, discussion uh, will be familiar with flannel. Uh, that's another component that we needed so that uh, every pod has its own IP in Kubernetes. So uh, we had to set up flannel across the board. So that's pretty much what our master nodes look like, right? So um, when so we considered ma the master pods that need to become up the uh, the API server things like that as artifacts, right? So we we have to template out certain aspects of them. So we actually um, 
uh, created Docker containers that we start up in Cloudernit, and then they output these config files um, to disk. That way, when Kubelet starts up, it it will um, you know add these add these things to the Docker containers running on the master host. So um, this cloud config it starts up at, it stops etcd because we run a dedicated etcd cluster. Um, it gets the etcd um, config from a, a container that I wrote that just queries AWS for the etcd IPs. Um, we uh, start up Flannel. Uh, that way we can, we can write uh, our uh, Flannel IPs into the etcd cluster, uh, but also then have the uh, IP uh, layer on these nodes. Uh, we, have, we have to grab certs. So if you looked at Kubernetes, one of the things of how all the nodes talk to each other is you have a CA, you have you know, master certs, and you have minion certs, and you can change it however you want. But um, to start out, you really just need to grab your certs from somewhere. So I locked down the permissions on S3 pretty heavily so that only specific nodes at certain times could pull. Uh, and so we pull down the, the um, certs on our master nodes. Whether this is also one of those caveats that's just like, you know, I'm a startup, I gotta move fast. If that doesn't look right, I'm sorry, you know? Like, uh, we, we, we need to do things more secure someday, but, uh, you know, that's one of the nice things about working at a startup. You can, you can just put things on S3. Uh, so you start up Docker, pretty straightforward, right? Uh, but one of the cool things in, uh, CoreOS is if you want to attach it to another service and make sure that it runs after that service, you can just drop in a drop-in right there. Um, and so we have Flannel that we make sure starts up first. Uh, then we have our Kubelet, much like the other, you know, what I was discussing a few minutes ago. We set up a cluster DNS IP, which we'll get back to later. Uh, basically, you also run your own DNS server internally. Um, and then you can set certain flags on this as well. All right, um, now there's also some funkiness with, with CoreOS, if you're familiar, that uh, user bin and user local bin are read-only, so you have to just put files elsewhere on disk. Um, so at the time, we just put them in Etsy bin, because why not? <laughs> uh, it, it, it worked. Um, they also have it, I think it's all containerized now. I think they have a Kubelet version that's fully containerized, but at the time, there were a few bugs uh, with running Kubelet in a container that started other containers. Um, but we pulled uh, the kubelet from S3, started it up, that's it. And then, like I said earlier, we used Terraform to build. This looks identical to the other one, right? Uh, but this one's the Terraform master. It's pretty straightforward. Um, like I said, it's a copy and paste job with Terraform. It's pretty straightforward. The minions. All right, the minions are the third part and the easiest part because you just did all the work. Uh, so the Kubelet service manages all other services for the minions as well, the proxy and the pods. Um, it's the exact same as the master, except without the master pods. So you don't need to start up the API server. You don't need to start up the schedulers. Um, all you need to do is connect to etcd and start flannel, the same as before. Uh, start up your Docker service and your Kubelet. And that's pretty much it. Uh, then we uh, use what's called manifests to uh, hard code the cube proxy. And the cube proxy is how the nodes actually communicate with each other um, and how the, the, the networking layer kind of talks between all the pods and all of the, uh, the master nodes. So you have to hard code uh, your, your uh, cube proxy in there with some uh, your certs and a few other configs. And again, all of this exists online. This is all kind of, we just modified it slightly to run uh, for our system. Uh, the, uh, the, so there's two other components to actually the configs. You have to tell it where to get the SSL certs. That's pretty much it. All right, so the results of, of our experiment here. Um, well, let's start with the bad. Um, Kubernetes does not, it, it's really young. It's really young. but it's built by a ton of really smart people, and it's based on uh, years and years of Google running containers at production. So even though it's not what they use uh, overall in production, it's really a lot like it. And if they started from the ground up, this is what it would look like. 
Um, it's actually not really Googleable. <laughs> uh, I was uh, onboarding a few of my uh, colleagues uh, a few months ago, and they were kind of just like, all right, well, there's a problem. I'm going to search Google for it, and I'm sure someone else has found it. And no, <laughs> it wasn't. But if you go on GitHub and uh, the Slack channel, then it's really easily able to be found. Uh, but for some reason, the GitHubers, GitHub issues don't show up in Google very easily, ironically. At least for me, um, it it uh, so um, the the manifest of writing and putting pods into Kubernetes is pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. It's just kind of different parameters, image the image, the ports, stuff like that. But it's it, at the time, especially, it's getting better now. It it didn't kind of just say, all right, here's an example, here's another example, here's another one you kind of have to dig around and you had to find the right way to do these things. And then you had to take one example and apply it to your way of doing it over here, which is okay. That's the way this stuff works. But it took me a while to figure out. And uh, part of what I'm going to be working on in the next few months is trying to contribute some of that stuff back to the, the community. Right now it's Docker only, uh, officially as far as I know. Um, but Rocket is coming soon. If you look, I think it's called Rocket Netties is kind of their nickname for it. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's another container engine that they announced yesterday and another one that they announced here yesterday that they're working on as well. Um, there's no DNS config support. So you run a DNS server internally on Kubernetes, but you still have to point your external DNS at your services in some way, right? So right now what my team does is we have Terraform make changes in Amazon uh, that point to our, our minion nodes. Um, and that's all kind of, you know, external from Kubernetes. Uh, but if you look in the docs for, I think, 1.3, uh, that's a new service that they're going to be adding is, you know, DNS support within the cluster that can manage uh, querying an external service to change DNS. Um, and personally, the last one was SaltStack, is, was the original choice of management. Now, SaltStack is cool. I like that. Uh, but the way that it was set up was kind of, you know, to get them from point A to point B. And it's not really something that I really wanted to run in production yet. Um, but that's OK. You know, I, I learned a whole lot, obviously, um, by experimenting. So the good news, there's a lot of really awesome things that Kubernetes does really well. It keeps your applications running. You kill an application, it comes right back. It's, it's stellar at this stuff. Like, you know, some, some, some schedulers I've seen that, you know, if you just try to simulate failover, uh, it, it, who knows what's going to happen, but like, oh yeah, 10 minutes later, all right, now you're good. You know, now it comes back. But uh, Kubernetes, you see the second you kill something, it starts recovering instantly, and uh, it fails over pretty quickly. Um, the liveliness and readiness of applications is all built into the framework as well. Uh, so, you know, let's say you're bringing up a Java app or something, you've got to wait for it to start up. Um, you can, you can set a readiness uh, query so that it, it checks a health check to make sure that your app is online um, before it starts directing traffic there. And then at the same time, you also have liveliness so that if that app stops responding, uh, it's taken out of the service. It's not sent traffic anymore. And that's all built in. Usually you got to build that stuff. Uh, and it just works. You can change your parameters however you want. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, mounting, uh, using cloud resources like volumes, uh, load balancers, um, it, it's gotten a lot better. Originally, uh, when I first started out with this, it was kind of, uh, with Amazon, it was kind of herky-jerky. Uh, but it's gotten, it's, it's pretty solid now. You, you spin up a load balancer type of service and, and ELB comes up in Amazon like that. Um, it takes a few minutes for the nodes to register, but that's an Amazon thing, not a Kubernetes thing. Um, and as well as, obviously, their first class citizen support is for Google Cloud, um, which is always, like, it just, it just works, obviously, because it's their cloud. Um, but it's, uh, their, their uh, volume mounting and load balancer services for that are, are stellar as well. Um, the internal DNS is pretty sweet. So every pod you bring up is namespaced and has DNS entries to it. So uh, what I'm going to show you guys in a few minutes is going to use different namespaces. And you can basically set up what I built my company's infrastructure on Kubernetes. Uh, I created a namespace for it. And if a new you know, engineer wants to spin up a whole stack, we just change the namespace name and there's no conflict. Um, you can reference the same namespace across the board. 
Uh, secret and config management. Uh, now these are kind of newer ones. The secret one has been around for quite a while where you can mount secrets into containers. Uh, now this, you know, we, we've talked a lot about this in the past day, uh, but it, it works pretty well. It's base64 encoded into etcd, so you're, you know, moving that secret problem over, over into the etcd side. Make sure your etcd uh, services are uh, well protected, but, uh, you know, it's one less thing to have to worry about at least. Kind of. <laughs> uh, the config management aspect has gotten so much better. Uh, you can use config maps. If you haven't looked at that, they're pretty awesome. Basically, you can put either a file or key value pairs into a config map, and then you can mount them into your containers, either as environment variables or a file, or there's a ton of different ways you can do it. Um, but they're, um, it, it's, it's really good. You, I, I don't really need much config management anymore for our infrastructure because of that. Um, it's very easily horizontally scalable. Uh, you can spin up, uh, you can scale down. Uh, I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, you can do rolling updates automatically with deployments, which means you can also do AB, you can do Canary, all that stuff. It comes out of the box, it just works. You want to roll back, done, no problem. It's pretty cool. Um, the support in GitHub and Slack are really, really good. Like I said earlier, the, you can't really Google it sometimes, but the support is there. You just got to look in GitHub. Usually there's a Slack issue if, you know, you're experiencing something, someone has, or a GitHub issue. Uh, usually someone has seen what you're seeing before. Uh, if not, like, I've created three or four, and they respond within minutes saying, looking into it, okay, found the bug, you're right. <laughs> so. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, and now, the, the, my favorite thing about Kubernetes, and this is what I drive home with the developers at my company, it's really easy to debug application problems. Because uh, you have log output from your apps. One command, kubectl logs. Uh, you can tail them, you know, write in your command line, no SSHing to a box. Assuming you set up your kubectl commands and you have connectivity over VPN or whatever, you're in. Um, and just like with Docker, you can execute right into a container, but you don't have to SSH to the box to do that. You know, so you can, from your, you know, d dev machine, you can say, all right, something funky's going on in my service, you know, execute into it and run some commands to see what's happening. So, all right, before I go much further, does anyone have any questions? We'll go come back to some more questions at the end, but any questions at this point? May the demo gods be with me. All right, so first of all, um, I just told you guys I would, uh, I would show you, oh, you can't see anything. All right, so um, we, when I went to solve the problem of our um, configuration, uh, we, we didn't really have much. So I just started creating, uh, you know, kind of like a directory structure for our environments. Um, and these are our Terraform, uh, um, configs that you kind of saw on that other page where we uh, we were spinning up clusters and then or you know spinning up uh, auto scaling groups and we had variables. These are the variables that got pumped into those uh, those things. So what we're actually going to do here is I I'm going to demo a real environment to you guys. So I kind of want to scale this thing up. Uh, so we're going to go right over here. We're going to change our minions from six to eight. Then I'm going to. We're going to scale up. Oops, that fingered. All right, so while that's happening, uh, now we're going to pull up, oh, look, my slides. FYI, they're already online. Um, nope, that's a bag review. I bought a new bag yesterday. It was nice. Um, all right, so we, uh, so I'm, my demo here is going to demonstrate quite a few different areas because I know that when the stuff I've seen, the stuff I've seen online has been the, you know, deploy a standard application, see what happens when it fails over. So if you're looking for that type of thing, Google it. There's a lot of them out there. I'm going to try to demonstrate a, a lot of different things that I haven't seen on screens yet. So one of them is uh, kind of how you roll out a change like this, where I'm just trying to scale up real quick, but I'm doing it via code, not via Amazon's, you know, uh, you know uh, UI. So this is our Jenkins server uh, that I built. And of course, it logged me out since I uh, last went in. 
Uh, so we're going to log back in real quick. Um, okay, so now the cool thing about this node is this is running on Kubernetes, uh, which means you can see over here, if you're familiar with Jenkins, we have no build executors except for one that has failed. Um, and that's because every build on this service uh, goes to a separate Kubernetes container. Uh, so everything starts up from scratch. You never have to worry about, you know, leftover junk on the, on the, on the box. You never have to worry about whatever. Um, it spins up a container every time you want to build something. So, uh, and some of this is kind of, you know, personalized with Jenkins plugins and all. Um, but it's, it, this took me a few days, like that's it, you know, to, to build this type of stuff. It's pretty straightforward. So we're going to schedule a build of our prod one environment. Yes, prod one, prod. Um, we right now are having a security audit done at my company on one of our prod environments, so we are using the other one. Um, so this is not getting production traffic, uh, but uh, it's basically next week we'll be getting production traffic. And it connects to our production database, so that's scary, right? Okay. So while this is going, it's going to do some of the things that I talked about earlier. It templates out all the configs. Uh, it's it's um, moving around some certs and everything, decrypting some files. Um, and then it's going to start, uh, we're going to see a Terraform run. Now, um, if you're familiar with Terraform, Terraform has this awesome concept of plan, which basically lets you see what it's going to do before it does it. Um, so it, it is aware of the previous state of our cluster. Um, and so right about now, it's going to start doing what we call planning. Um, and we'll see what it's going to do next. All right, so it pulls our state. It's refreshing the state of Amazon real quick. And now, this is the cool part about Jenkins. So the new version of Jenkins, this is using the new Jenkins pipelining. Um, and after I output the plan, you can see right here, we're changing the desired capacity from six to eight. And then I ask for approval. Okay, I've never actually, I've seen people do that, but I've never done it myself. That's pretty straightforward to like, you know, is that what you want to do, plan, you know, approve? Okay, cool. Um, now I've approved this change. It's going into prod. It's going to actually run it for real. Um, now, you know, I've worked for big companies, and we've been able to do that with complicated build systems. But as a startup, this, I built this in like a few hours. So honestly, it's, it's awesome to be able to do this and be like, what's going to happen before I hit the big red button, you know? All right, so we're going to scale up. Um, if we go over into uh, EC2 over here, um, we won't see anything there. We'll see auto scaling groups. And of course, it's too big. So we see our minion over here is. Uh, is going to start scaling up. So it's got six nodes right now. It's scaling up to eight. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. A lot of people have seen auto scaling happen, but uh, this is you know kind of the scaling starting up. Uh, two of the nodes are now coming online, but I don't really care about it. They're they're going to set themselves up. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. All right. So um, I'm going to get this out of the way and get this out of the way. And get this out of the way. All right. So can you guys see that still? Um, so we have our, um, so the next part of what I wanted to, well, here, I can show you real quickly. Um, if you're, when you're connected to a Kubernetes cluster, you can actually start querying it for, for different information. So we're going to do get pod. You can get all. Um, namespaces, so we can actually see um, a lot of the, the namespaces we have. Here's our actual production uh, services running. Uh, one of them is failing because a developer made a problem last night, and I'm not going to fix it. They've got to fix it themselves. Uh, you can see we run etcd within our cluster there, uh, and that's what I'm about to talk about in a second. Um, you can see all the other proxy pieces, API server, scheduler, sysdig, all sorts of stuff that we run internally to make sure that our, you know, our platform stays up. Um, and we can also do uh, kubectl uh, get nodes, and we can actually see our nodes uh, currently in the cluster. Oh, come on. Really? It's, oh, there we go. All right. It's too early for that. I haven't done anything risky yet. 
Um, so you can see here are our nodes. You see the age. Uh, in a few minutes when I run this, you'll see that we have a few more nodes online. All right, so let's go to some more of the interesting stuff here. Um, so uh, etcd, um, there's, a, there's a problem with making etcd manage itself. Uh, it, the main thing etcd has to be aware of is if a, a cluster already exists. If a cluster exists, uh, it needs to connect to the other nodes, figure out if there's a dead node, and replace the node, right? Um, otherwise, it needs to assume that it's a new cluster, as an example. Uh, that way, the, you know, a cluster comes up safely. Um, so what I've done is I built a little demo here. Um, I even wrote a readme. You should be proud of me, Mom. Um, so uh, we're going to spin up a, a, a simple namespace here, uh, and we're going we're to walk through how you might spin up etcd in uh, Kubernetes. So when, I, when you look at the uh, Kubernetes documentation, uh, they do quite a bit of this, um, uh, similarly to how I'm going to demo it to you guys right now. But what they don't talk about is how you actually fail it over. They, there's, there's like no documentation of like, all right, so you've got etcd running in your cluster. What now? If it goes down, you have to do manual etcd management, which, you know, it works, but it, I don't, I, that's not what I want to do. You know, I don't mind if it's a little bit herky-jerky or whatever, but, it, you know, I wanted to try to manage itself the best it can. So um, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, we're going to walk through a few different components. This is the namespace, which we're creating demo one. Um, just creating a label called demo one, that's pretty much it. Uh, we're going to have services. Um, so if you've taken a look at um, the documentation, the examples for etcd, um, this might look familiar to you. Uh, you set up uh, four services the way that they've documented it uh, for the most part. One is an etcd service that manages all of your etcd nodes. We're building a three node cluster. Um, so this first one is going to kind of encapsulate all of the nodes uh, by using a selector for just etcd itself. Right? Then you have to have a service for each one of your nodes. That way they can communicate with each other. Uh, a service will be mapped to an IP. That way you always just map, you know, etcd1 wants to talk to etcd2 and 3, etcd2, 1 and 3, 3, 1 and 2, right? Um, so this way the service always maps one to one with etcd, etcd node number one. Get it? All right, so we have three of these services that map one to one with etcd nodes. Uh, then we're going to use a new feature uh, from Kubernetes 1.2 uh, called volumes. Uh, now volumes have been around for a while, but the new one are called persistent volume claims. And if you're using Amazon or Google Cloud, and I think also OpenStack, um, it'll automatically provision them for you, uh, which is pretty new. Uh, so if you add this storage class parameter, um, it'll actually provision for you in AWS. Uh, now, like I was mentioning earlier, I had to dig through code to figure this out. Uh, there, was, there was this tiny file somewhere that said, oh, storage class set it to blah, and now it works. Well, there it is. So uh, take a look at that. That's pretty awesome. Uh, we set uh, these nodes can access it read write once. Uh, that basically means you're only mounting it to one node, uh, and that node can read write it. Uh, they've, they've set it up for the future so that um, you know, you could read write to many, that way many nodes can contact the same storage. Um, but for e uh, EBS volumes, you can only mount it to one node right now. So we're going to do three volumes here. And then we have our replication controllers. So uh, now if you're, you're familiar with Kubernetes, you know that a replication controller is basically what ensures a pod is always running. The pod is the lowest level. Pod contains many containers. Uh, and uh, a replication controller makes sure that n number of pods are always running. So you can see right here, uh, we make sure there's always replica of one. Makes it pretty easy. That way we're, we're sure it's running. Um, then you can also see this one's called etcd1. Um, oops, I'm on the wrong uh, replication controller. All right, so this is etcd number one. Um, it always pulls the image, which is pretty cool. That way, you don't have to take care of that with Docker. Um, your container ports are all set and exposed. You can set your CPU limits, your memory limits. Um, and here's where we're going to actually mount our storage in. And in my scripts, basically, we'll look at the storage and say, has this storage been bootstrapped before, AKA, does the cluster exist? That way, it, it queries real quickly to figure out, do I need to either A, bootstrap a new cluster, or B, join an existing cluster and remove dead nodes. 
So we set environment variables uh, to on how to talk to the other nodes. So this this host's name is etcd1. The other ones is etcd2 and 3, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we do this for each of them. Uh, at the bo bottom here, you actually mount that persistent volume that we talked about a second ago into the container. So this, all this code is online as well that you guys can take a look at on GitHub. So we're going to start off by uh, creating this volume version. Um, start off by creating our namespace. That way it's unique. And over here on the right, I'm tailing, uh, I'm watching our pods that are in the cluster. So we're going to start off by creating the services. That way, when these pods come up, they can communicate with each other. But right now, the services won't have any pods in them because, well, there's no pods, right? So um, then we're going to start off, we're going to create the volumes. So if I go back over here to Amazon uh, and go into volumes, there's none there. Great. Thank you, demo. There they are. So now we have three dynamically provisioned uh, volumes in uh, Amazon from Kubernetes. Uh, if you look at tags here, it tags them very helpfully uh, with a terrible name, a terrible uh, other name, uh, and then something that's actually useful here. But it works. All right, so we've done that. Now we actually want to spin up the cluster. So on the right over here, we're going to start seeing the cluster come up. The containers are creating. What it's actually doing here in the background is mapping those volumes we just created in AWS over to actual instances uh, automatically for you. So you can see now all the state of those instances is in use. Uh, that means they're automatically mounted to our Kubernetes instances. You can see that our cluster is starting up. But if you're familiar with volume mounting, it's not fast, right? So it takes a while. Our cluster is still coming online. Um, hopefully, it'll bootstrap in a second since I only have five minutes. <laughs> um, but it can take a minute or two just for the bootstrapping process to finish, um, which doesn't work great, especially when then it comes to failover, right? You know, if we want to fail over one of these nodes, which I'm going to start setting up now, um, it's, it's going to take a while for it to fail over properly. All right, so we have a cluster running now. Uh, just trust me, it's alive. I was going to go into it, but uh, we're not going to right now. Um, so, no. So we're going to delete one of these pods uh, and see what happens. So you can see we're terminating one of these pods. Now, luckily, we're actually not moving the volume between uh, hosts over there, which kind of uh, is not you know, demonstrated. Uh, demonstrating the actual problem here. But if we go in here, I'm going to kill this new one before it even has a chance to live. And it puts it on the same host again. That's cool. Try one more time, and we'll, we'll call it. Oh. All right, so it doesn't want to move this volume. It's, it's feeling a bit crabby right now. Um, but trust me, this failover, it takes a while because it's going to move a volume across, uh, across instances. So I started thinking about um, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, we've got to be able to, uh, to more quickly fail over services like this, especially when Kubernetes provides so much. So the second half of my demo is uh, an API method. So this is something that I came up with um, since I saw a lot of people were starting to use the APIs of Kubernetes to to, to manage the services themselves. Um, much like the first one, we're going um, to spin up a namespace. This is a separate namespace, completely independent of the first one. We're going to spin up our services. And this one is using something called config map, which I'm going to go demonstrate real quick right here. Um, and so what we do is we set a config map property. This is also new in Kubernetes 1.2. It's uh, just a key value. So we set initial cluster state is new. Right? So whenever we build this cluster the first time, we, we make sure that that says new. Pretty simple. We're going to upload that file now. That way, the config maps are all online. Now, we're going to uh, create our replication controllers the same way we did before. Um, and we're going to see that the config maps are mounted into these. The, uh, when it comes online, as you can see, if you look in my scripts, 
um, it will actually, before, before the actual etcd cluster starts up real quick, it'll query the AWS API, check that value, uh, and if it says new cluster, it'll change it to existing and then start up. So now we have our cluster starting up. One last piece of it. Oops. So if we delete one of these nodes now, uh, we have a working cluster here. Uh, if we delete one, um, we're going to see it, oh, not found. Oh, thank you. So you see it terminating the other one, the new one starting up, none of that volume mounting crap, and uh, there we've solved a real problem. Uh, the readiness is the one last piece that'll come into play once it's actually bootstrapped and in, but that's kind of how you really solve a problem in Kubernetes. You work through it, and it restarted once because uh, it timed out, it took too long. Uh, I'm very impatient with my pods, so I don't give them a lot of leeway if they feel like slacking. Um, but in a second, it'll come online. Um, now, I only have another second left, but uh, I wanted to show you real quickly. This is uh, my company's uh, portal. Uh, this is what we show to users, it queries an API, all that jazz. Uh, so I'm going to do the crazy thing and delete a server here. Um, so this shows my confidence in some of what we built with Kubernetes. Um, it just kind of works for a lot of this stuff. So we can see over here, these are all our different uh, uh, pods that are running. Um, we're going to pick a nice one over here. Um, we're going to delete this server from Amazon and see what happens. Now, sometimes this goes great. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to show is here we've got a, our prod one minion. I'm just going to delete this. Uh, not many people are willing to do this in a demo, right? Um, and there's a chance. This will load. There's a chance it won't load. Let's see. Oh, we're loading. We're slow, but we're loading. We're deleting a server. This is a catastrophic problem in traditional you know, infrastructure, and we're seeing no impact, zero impact at this moment. <laughs> um, and so right now, Kubernetes isn't quite aware that that's actually happening yet. It's still trying to figure out. It's saying, all right, something might be going on here. It's failed out. We have uh, these controllers called ingress controllers that actually are preventing traffic from going to those nodes behind the scenes right now. Um, and right now, you see it's moving things around. It's realized the node that was there previously is gone. I'm going to take care of this, move things around. We moved this heapster one. Uh, these two are currently moving as well. This is our etcd cluster. We failed two etcd nodes out in this demo but they're going to come back online, hopefully. <laughs> and then these nodes just recovered completely. Um, so this is just a small demo of some of the things you can do. Oh, look, etcd problems. Of course, that happens. Um, this is just a small demo of some of the things that you can do in Kubernetes, uh, some of the problems you might have, some of the, the experiences that we've had. Um, I appreciate every, you know, uh, you guys coming out. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think we have about one minute. Yeah. Uh, easy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the question was, why did I choose Amazon Cloud, and why did I choose Kubernetes over uh, uh, Amazon uh, Container Service? Uh, the first question, uh, Amazon versus anything else. Uh, when I got there, Amazon was in place. That was it. Um, I would love to try Google, I would love to try all these other things, but I just want to build. I'm an engineer, I like to do things, so I didn't want to fight that battle. And as for container service, it was uh, in beta at the time, and uh, it only supported just basic Docker stuff, and it seemed like there was a lot of overhead to just getting going with it, so I, I really wanted to be able to scale long term for our business, so I went with Kubernetes. There are, yes, and that's a great point. And so I, I, I went through some of this today to kind of um, demonstrate what we did. I don't think you should have to do this today. Now, I learned a lot. I learned how all of this works, but there is a hell of a lot more out there. So if you go to the docs like I showed at the beginning, um, there's a lot of information on there. There's a workshop this afternoon uh, also where, uh, where Ray is going to be going over a lot of this, and he's going to be demoing a lot as well from Google. Um, 
I know that there's a Terraform script for this, but you know, it didn't exist at the time. So yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Where do you, uh, where do you store your Terraform state files? Where do you store your Terraform state files? That's a good point. Uh, there's a remote function in Terraform where you can push to remotes. And so now that we do everything in Jenkins, we never actually push from our local machines using Terraform. Uh, we push up, you know, the first step is pull down from S3, uh, and then, you know, at the end of your run, you push it back up. Um, that's pretty much, that's, that's pretty much the way it works for us. And because it's in Jenkins, we're ensuring that we don't stomp on each other um, because we only let that one job run at the same time. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, if you guys have any questions on Kubernetes or how we did it, um, feel free to come up and talk to me. Um, like I said at the beginning, this is the slide with a bunch of resources and my information. Um, thanks for coming out.